Chapter One. All set for a summer holiday. Four children were singing at the tops of their voices in a car that was going up a steep mountainside road. A parrot was also joining in, very much out of tune, cocking up her crest in excitement. The man at the wheel turned round with a grin. "I say, I can't even hear the car hooter. What's the matter with you all?" Philip, Jack, Dinah, and Lucy Ann stopped singing and shouted answers at him. "It's the beginning of the holes, and we're going to have a donkey each to ride in the mountains. Pop goes the weasel." That was Kiki the parrot, of course, joining in. We've got eight weeks of fun all together, and you'll be with us, Bill, as well as Mother. Mother, aren't you excited too? Mrs. Mannering smiled at Philip. Yes, but I hope you're not going to be as noisy as this all the time, Bill. You'll have to protect me from this rowdy crowd of children. I'll protect you all right, promised Bill, swinging the car round another bend. I'll knock all their heads together once a day at least, and if Lucy Ann starts getting tough with me, I'll. Oh, Bill," said Lucy Ann, the youngest and least boisterous of the lot. "Jack's always saying I'm not tough enough. I ought to be by now, though, considering all the adventures I've been through." "Tough enough, tough enough," chanted Kiki the parrot, who loved words that sounded alike. "Tough enough, tough." "Oh, stop her." Groaned Mrs. Mannering. She was tired with their long car journey and was hoping it would soon be over. She had eight weeks of the children's holidays before her and was quite sure she would be worn out before the end of it. Philip and Dinah were her own children, and Jack and Lucy Ann, who had no parents, lived with her in the holidays and loved her as if she were their own mother. Bill Cunningham was their very good friend and had had some hair-raising adventures with them. He had come with them on these holidays to keep them out of any more adventures, or so he said. Mrs. Mannering vowed she was not going to let them out of her sight for eight weeks unless Bill was with them. Then they couldn't possibly disappear or fall into some dreadful new adventure. They ought to be safe, tucked away in the Welsh mountains, with both you and me, Bill, to look after them," said Mrs. Mannering. Mr. Mannering had been dead for many years. And Mrs. Mannering often found it difficult to cope with so many lively children at once. Now that they were growing older, Philip loved any animal, bird or insect. His sister Dinah didn't share this love at all, and disliked most wild animals, and hated quite a number of harmless insects. Though she was certainly better than she used to be, she was a hot-tempered girl, as ready to use her fists as Philip, and they had many a battle, much to gentle Lucy Ann's dismay. Lucy Ann and Jack were brother and sister too. Kiki the parrot was Jack's beloved bird, usually to be found on his shoulder. In fact, Mrs. Mannering had once actually suggested that she should put a little leather patch on the shoulders of each of Jack's coats to stop Kiki from wearing thin places there with her clawed feet. Jack was fond of birds, and he and Philip spent many an exciting hour together bird watching or taking photographs. They had a marvelous collection of these. Which Bill said was worth a lot of money. They had brought cameras with them on this holiday, and of course their field glasses for watching birds at a distance. We might see eagles again," said Jack. "Do you remember the eagle's nest we found near that old castle in Scotland once, Philip? We might see buzzards too." Buzz, 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 buzz," said Kiki at once. "Buzz, buzz off." We might even have an adventure," said Philip with a grin. Though Mother and Bill are quite certain they will guard us from even the smallest one this time. Now here they were, all set for a wonderful holiday in the Welsh mountains, in a very lonely spot where they could wander about with cameras and field glasses wherever they liked. Each child was to have a donkey so that they could ride along the narrow mountain paths as much as they wished. I shan't always come with you," said Mrs. Mannering, "because I'm not so thrilled with donkey riding as you are." But Bill will be with you, so you'll be safe. Ah, but will Bill be safe with us? Said Jack with a grin. We always seem to drag him into something or other. Poor Bill. If you manage to pull me into an adventure in the middle of some of the loneliest of the Welsh mountains, you'll be clever," said Bill. The car swung round another bend, and a farmhouse came into sight. We're nearly there," 
said Mrs. Mannering. "I believe I can see the farmhouse we're going to stay at. Yes, there it is." The children craned their necks to see it. It was a rambling old stone place set on the mountainside, with barns and outbuildings all around. In the evening sunset, it looked welcoming and friendly. Lovely," said Lucy Ann. "What's it called?" Bill said something that sounded like "Doth Goth U Eli Othol In." Gracious," said Dinah. "What a name! Not even Kiki could pronounce that. I'm sure. Tell her it, Bill. See what she says." Bill obligingly told the name to the parrot, who listened solemnly and raised her crest politely. "Now, just you repeat that," said Jack to Kiki. Go on. This is the house that Jack built," said the parrot, running all the words together. The children laughed. "Good try, Kiki," said Jack. "You can't stump Kiki, Bill. She'll always say something." Good old Kiki. Kiki was pleased by this praise and made a noise like the car changing gear. She had been doing this at intervals during the whole of the journey and had nearly driven Mrs. Mannering mad. "Don't let Kiki start that again." She begged, "Thank goodness we are here at last. Where's the front door, Bill? Or isn't there one?" There didn't seem to be one. The track went up to what appeared to be a barn and stopped there. A small path then ran to the farmhouse, divided into three, and went to three different doors. The children tumbled out of the car. Bill got out and stretched his legs. He helped Mrs. Mannering out, and they all looked round. A cock nearby crowed. And Kiki promptly crowed too, much to the cock's astonishment. A plump, red-faced woman came hurrying out of one of the doors, a welcoming smile on her face. She called behind her to someone in the house. "Evans, Evans, they have come! Look, you, they have come!" "Ah, Mrs. Evans," said Bill, and shook hands with her. Mrs. Mannering did the same. A small man came running out of the house and came up to them too. This is Evans, my husband," said the plump woman. "We hope you will be very happy with us, whatever." This was said in a pleasant, sing-song voice that the children liked very much. Everybody shook hands solemnly with Mrs. Evans and her husband, and Kiki held out a claw as well. "A parrot, look you!" cried Mrs. Evans to her husband. "Evans, a parrot!" Mr. Evans didn't seem to like the look of Kiki as much as his wife did, but he smiled politely. It is very welcome you are," he said in his sing-song voice. "Will you please to come this way?" They all followed Evans. He led them to the farmhouse, and when the door was flung open, what a welcome sight met the children's eyes! A long, sturdy kitchen table was covered with a snow-white cloth, and on it was set the finest meal the children had ever seen in their lives. A great ham sat ready to be carved. A big tongue garnished round with bright green parsley sat by its side. An enormous salad with hard-boiled eggs sprinkled generously all over it was in the middle of the table. Two cold roast chickens were on the table too, with little curly bits of cold bacon set round. The children's eyes nearly fell out of their heads. What a feast! And the scones and cakes, the jams and the pure yellow honey, the jugs of creamy milk. I say, are you having a party or something? Asked Jack in awe. A party? No, no. It is high tea for you, look you," said Mrs. Evans. "We cannot do dinners for you at night. We are busy people. You shall have what we have, and that is all. Here is high tea for you today, and when you have washed, it is ready." Oh, have we got to wash? Said Philip with a sigh. I'm clean enough. Golly, look at that meal! I say, if we're going to have food like this, these holds, I shan't want to go donkey riding at all. I'll just stay here and eat. Well, if you do that, you'll be too fat for any donkey to carry," said his mother. "Go and wash, Philip. Mrs. Evans will show us our rooms. We can all do with a wash and a brush, and then we can do justice to this magnificent meal." Up some narrow, winding stairs went the little party. Into big, low-ceilinged rooms set with heavy, old-fashioned furniture, Mrs. Evans proudly showed them a small bathroom put in for visitors to the farmhouse. There were four rooms for the party. 
Bill had a small one to himself. Mrs. Mannering had a big one, well away from the children's rooms because they were often so noisy in the mornings. Philip and Jack had a curious little room together, whose ceiling slanted almost to the floor, and the girls had a bigger one next door. Isn't this going to be fun? said Jack, scrubbing his hands vigorously in the bathroom whilst Kiki sat on a tap. I'm longing to get at that meal downstairs. What a spread! Move up, said Dinah impatiently. There's room for two at this basin. We shall have to take it in turns to come in in the morning. Oh, Kiki, don't fly off with the nail brush. Jack, stop her. The nail brush was rescued, and Kiki was tapped on the beak. She didn't mind. She was looking forward to the food downstairs as much as the children were. She had seen a bowl of raspberries, which she meant to sit as near to as possible. She flew to Jack's shoulder. And muttered loving things into his ear whilst he dried his hands on a very rough towel. Stop it, Kiki, you tickle, said Jack. Are you ready, you others? Aunt Ellie, Bill, are you ready? We're going downstairs. Coming, cried the others, and down they all went. Now for a proper feast. Chapter Two At the Farmhouse. That first meal in the Welsh farmhouse was a very happy one. Mrs. Evans was excited to have visitors, and Evans, her husband, beamed all round as he carved great slices of ham, tongue, and chicken. There were a lot of look yous and what effers, and Kiki was especially interested in the up and down song like way the two Welsh folk talked. Wipe your feet, whatever, she said to Mrs. Evans suddenly. Mrs. Evans looked surprised. She hadn't heard the parrot speak before. Shut the door, look you! Commanded Kiki, raising her crest. The children squealed with laughter. She's speaking Welsh already, said Dinah. Hey, watch her, Jack. She's absolutely wolfing those raspberries. Jack put a plate over the bowl, and Kiki was angry. She made a noise like the car changing gear, and Evans looked startled. It's all right. It's only Kiki, said Jack. She can make all kinds of noises. You should hear her give her imitation of a train whistling in a tunnel. Kiki opened her beak and swelled up her throat as if she was about to make this horrible noise. Mrs. Mannering spoke hastily. Jack, don't let Kiki make that noise. If she does, you'll have to take her upstairs and put her in your bedroom. Bad Kiki, naughty Kiki, said the parrot solemnly, recognizing the stern tone in Mrs. Mannering's voice. She flew to Jack's shoulder and cuddled there, eyeing the plate that he had put over the bowl of raspberries. She gave his ear a little nip. What a meal that was for six very hungry travellers who had had nothing but sandwiches all day long. Even Mrs. Mannering ate more than she had ever eaten before at one meal. Mrs. Evans kept beaming round as she filled the plates. There is plenty more in the larder, look you, she said. Evans, go fetch the meat pie. No, no," said Mrs. Mannering. "Please don't. We have more than enough here. It's only that we are extra hungry, and the food is so very, very good." Mrs. Evans was pleased. "It is plain country food, but it is very good for the children," she said. "They will soon have good appetites in this mountain air, look you." "Indeed, to goodness they will," agreed Evans. "Their appetites are small yet; they will grow." Mrs. Mannering looked rather alarmed. "Good gracious, I've never in my life seen them eat so much. If their appetites get any bigger, I'll never be able to feed them at home." "And we shall starve at school," grinned Jack. "The poor boy," said Mrs. Evans. "It is a big ham I must give him to take back whatever." At last, nobody could eat any more. They sat back from the table, looking out of the wide, low windows and the big open door. What a view! Great mountains reared up their heads in the evening light. Deep shadows lay across the valley, but the mountains still caught the sunlight and gleamed enchantingly. It was all so different from the country round their home, and the children felt that they could never look long enough on the mountain tops and the shadowed valleys below. You are very lonely here," said Bill. "I can't see a single house or farm anywhere. My brother lives on the other side of that mountain." Said Mrs. Evans, pointing. 
I see him at the market each week. That is ten miles away, or maybe eleven. And my sister lives beyond that mountain you can see there. She too has a farm. So we have neighbours, you see. Yes, but not next door ones, said Dinah. Don't you ever feel cut off and lonely here, Mrs. Evans? Mrs. Evans looked surprised. Lonely? Indeed to goodness. What is there to be lonely about with Evans by my side, and the shepherd up on the hills, and the cowherd and his wife in their cottage nearby? And there is plenty of animals, as you will see. Hens wandered in and out of the open door, pecking up crumbs fallen from the table. Kiki watched them intently. She began a warm clucking noise, and the hens clucked back. A cock came strutting in and looked round for the hen that had a cluck he didn't quite know. Cock a doodle doo! Suddenly crowed the cock defiantly, catching sight of Kiki on Jack's shoulder. Cock a doodle doo! Answered Kiki, and the cock immediately jumped up onto the table to fight the crowing parrot. He was shooed down and ran out indignantly, followed by a cackle of laughter from Kiki. Evans held his sides and laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. <laughs> that is a fine bird, look you," he said to Jack, quite losing his heart to Kiki. "Let her help herself to the raspberries again." "She's had enough, thank you very much," said Jack. Pleased at Evans's praise of Kiki, people sometimes didn't like the parrot, and when she went away with him, Jack was always anxious in case anyone should object to her. They all wandered out into the golden evening air, happy and well satisfied. Bill and Mrs. Mannering sat on an old stone wall, watching the sun sink behind a mountain in the west. The four children went round the farmhouse and its buildings. Pigs, and what a marvelous clean pigsty! Said Dinah, "I've never seen a clean pig before. Look at this one, fat and shining as if it's been scrubbed. It probably has in preparation for our coming." Said Philip, "I love these little piglets too. Look at them rooting round with their funny little snouts." Kiki will soon have a wonderful collection of noises," said Lucy Ann, hearing the parrot giving a very lifelike grunt. "She'll be able to moo and bellow and grunt and crow and cluck." And gobble like a turkey," said Dinah, seeing some turkeys nearby. "This is a lovely farm. They've got everything. Oh, Philip, look at that kid!" There were some goats on the mountainside not far off, and with them was a kid. It was snow white, dainty, and altogether lovely. Philip stood looking at it, loving it at once. He made a curious little bleating noise, and all the goats looked round and stopped eating. The kid pricked up its little white ears and stood quivering on its slender legs. It was very young and new. Philip made the noise again. The kid left its mother and came leaping to him. It sprang right into his arms and nestled there, butting its soft white head against Philip's chin. "Oh, Philip, isn't it sweet?" said the girls and stroked the little thing and rubbed their cheeks against its snow white coat. I wish animals came to me like they come to you, Philip," said Lucy Ann enviously. It was amazing the attraction that Philip had for creatures of any kind. Even a moth would rest contentedly on his finger, and the number of strange pets he had had was unbelievable: hedgehogs, stag beetles, lizards, young birds, mice, rats. You never knew what Philip would have next. All creatures loved him and trusted him, and he in turn understood them and loved them too. Now this kid will follow at his heels like a dog the whole time we're here," said Dinah. "Well, I'm glad it will be a kid, not a cow. Do you remember that awful time when Philip went into a field with a herd of cows in, and they all went to him and nuzzled him and followed him about like dogs? They even tried to get over the gate and through the hedge when he went out. I was awfully scared they would. You ought to be ashamed of being afraid of cows," said Philip, stroking the kid. "There's no reason to be, Di." It's surprising you're not afraid of this kid. I bet you'd run if the goats came near. I shouldn't," said Dinah indignantly. But all the same, she moved off hurriedly when the herd of goats, curious at seeing the kid in Philip's arms, began to come nearer to the children. Soon they were all round Philip, Lucy Ann, and Jack. Dinah watched from a distance. The kid bleated when it saw its mother, but as soon as Philip put the little thing down to run to her. 
it leapt straight back into his arms. Well, you'll have to take it to bed with you tonight, there's no doubt about that, said Jack, grinning. Come on, let's go and see the horses. They're the kind with shaggy hooves. I just love those. The goats were shooed off, and the children went to look at the great horses standing patiently in the field. There were three of them. They all came to Philip at once, of course. He had put down the little kid, and now it followed so close to his heels that every time he stopped, it ran into his legs. At the first possible chance, it sprang into his arms again. It followed him into the farmhouse, too. Oh, you have found little Snowy, said Mrs. Evans, looking round from her oven with a face redder than ever. He has not left his mother before, look you. Oh, Philip, don't bring the kid in here, said Mrs. Mannering, seeing at once that yet another animal had attached itself to Philip. She was afraid that Mrs. Evans would object strongly to the kid coming indoors with Philip, and once it had felt the boy's attraction, nothing would stop it from following him anywhere, even upstairs. Oh, it is no matter if a kid comes into the house, said Mrs. Evans. We have the newborn lambs in, and the hens are always in and out. And Mooley the calf used to come in each day before she was put in the field. The children thought it was a wonderful idea to let creatures wander in and out like that, but Mrs. Mannering thought differently. She wondered if she would find eggs laid in her bed, or a calf in her bedroom chair. Still, it was a holiday, and if Mrs. Evans liked creatures wandering all over her kitchen, the children would like it too. Lucy Ann gave an enormous yawn and sank down into a big chair. Mrs. Mannering looked at her, and then at the grandfather clock ticking in a corner. Go to bed, all of you, she said. We're all tired. Yes, I know it's early, Philip. You don't need to tell me that. But we've had a long day, and this mountain air is very strong. We shall all sleep like tops tonight. I will get ready some creamy milk for you, began Mrs. Evans. And you would like some buttered scones and jam to take up with you? Oh, no, said Mrs. Mannering. We simply couldn't eat a thing more tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Evans. Oh, mother, of course we could eat scones and jam and drink some more of that heavenly milk, said Dinah indignantly. So they each took up a plate of scones and raspberry jam and a big glass of creamy milk to have in bed. There came the scampering of little hooves. And Snowy the kid appeared in the boy's bedroom. He leapt in delight onto Philip's bed. Gosh, look at this! Snowy's come upstairs, said Philip. Have a bit of scone, Snowy. I say, did we hear the kid coming up the stairs? said Lucy Ann, putting her head round the door of the boy's room. Oh, Philip, you've got him on your bed. Well, he won't get off, said Philip. As soon as I push him off, he's on again. Look, like a puppy. <laughs> said the kid in a soft, bleating voice, and butted Philip with his head. Are you going to have it up here all the night? asked Dinah, appearing in her pajamas. Well, if I put it outside, it'll only come in again, and if I shut the door, it will come and butt it with its head, said Philip, who had quite lost his heart to Snowy. After all, Jack has Kiki in the room with him all night. Oh, I don't mind you having Snowy, said Dinah. I just wondered what Mother would say, that's all. And Mrs. Evans. I shouldn't be at all surprised to hear that Mrs. Evans has got a sick cow in her room and half a dozen hens, said Philip, arranging Snowy in the crook of his knees. She's a woman after my own heart. Go away, you girls. I'm going to sleep. I'm very happy, full of scones and jam and milk and sleep. Kiki made a hiccuping noise. Pardon? she said. This was a new thing she had learnt from somebody at Jack's school the term before. It made Mrs. Mannering cross. I should think Kiki's full up too, said Jack sleepily. She pinched her whole scone, and I'm sure she's been at the raspberries again. Look at her beak. <laughs> Now, shut up, Kiki. I want to go to sleep. Pop goes the weasel, look you, said Kiki solemnly, and put her head under her wing. The girls disappeared. The boys fell asleep. What a lovely beginning to a summer holiday. Chapter 3 The First Morning The next day, the two girls awoke first. It was early, 
but somebody was already about in the yard. Lucy Ann peeped out of the window. It's Evans, she said. He must have been milking. Dinah, come here. Did you ever see such a glorious view in your life? The two girls knelt at the window. The sun was streaming across the valley below the opening between two mountains, but the rest of the vale was in shadow. In the distance, many mountains reared their great heads, getting bluer and bluer the further they were away. The sky was blue without a cloud. Holiday weather! Real holiday weather! said Dinah happily. I hope Mother lets us go picnicking today. There's one thing about this holiday, said Lucy Ann. We shan't have any awful adventures because Aunt Ally is absolutely determined to go with us or send Bill with us wherever we go. Well, we've had our share of adventures, said Dinah, beginning to dress. More than most children ever have. I don't mind if we don't have one this time. Hurry, Lucy Ann, then we can get to the bathroom before the boys. Don't make too much row because Mother doesn't want to be wakened too early. Lucy Ann popped her head in at the boys' room on the way to the bathroom. They were still sound asleep. Kiki took her head from under her wing as she heard Lucy Ann at the door, but she said nothing, only yawned. Lucy Ann looked closely at Philip's bed. Snowy the kid was still there, cuddled into the crook of Philip's knees. Lucy Ann's heart warmed to Philip. What an extraordinary boy he was to have every creature so fond of him and to be able to do anything he liked with them. The little kid raised its head and looked at Lucy Ann. She fled to the bathroom and washed with Dinah. They soon heard the boys getting up and Kiki's voice telling somebody to wipe his feet. She's probably teaching a few manners to Snowy, giggled Lucy Ann. Kiki always tries to teach things to all Philip's pets. Oh, Dinah, do you remember how funny she was with Huffin and Puffin, the two puffins we found when we had our last adventure? Ah! said Dinah, making the noise the puffins used to make. Kiki heard them. Ah! she called from the boys' bedroom. Ah! Then she went off into a cackle of laughter, and Snowy the kid stared at her in alarm. Meh! <coughs> said the kid. Meh! <coughs> said Kiki. And the kid looked all round for another kid. The boys laughed. Kiki, always encouraged when people laughed, swelled up her throat to make the noise of a car changing gear, her favourite noise of the moment. But Philip stopped her hurriedly. Stop it, Kiki! We've had enough of that noise. Do forget it. God save the Queen, said Kiki in a dismal voice. Wipe your feet, blow your nose. Come on, said the girls, putting their heads in. Slow coaches. They all went downstairs just as Mrs. Evans was setting the last touches to the breakfast table. It was loaded almost as much as the supper table the night before. Jugs of creamy milk stood about the table, warm from the milking, and big bowls of raspberries had appeared again. I shan't know what to have," groaned Jack, sitting down with Kiki on his shoulder. "I can smell eggs and bacon, and there's cereal to have with raspberries and cream." And ham, and tomatoes, and gosh, is that cream cheese? Cream cheese for breakfast? How super! Snowy the kid tried to get onto Philip's knee as he sat down to breakfast. He pushed him off. No, Snowy, not at meal times. I'm too busy then. Go and say good morning to your mother. She must wonder where you are. Kiki was at work on the raspberries. Mrs. Evans had actually put a plate aside for Kiki's own breakfast. She and Evans beamed at the bird. They both thought she was wonderful. Look, you, whatever," said Kiki, and dipped her beak into the raspberries again. It was rapidly becoming pink with the juice. The children had an extremely good meal before Bill or Mrs. Mannering came down. The Evanses had had theirs already. In fact, they seemed to have done a day's work, judging by the list of things that Evans talked about. He had cleaned out the pigs, groomed the horses. Milked the cows, fetched in the eggs, been to see the cow herd, and a dozen other things besides. Mrs. Evans, do you know where the donkeys are that we arranged to have for riding in the mountains? Asked Philip when he had finished his breakfast and Snowy was once more in his arms. Ah, Trefor the shepherd will tell you," said Mrs. Evans. "It is his brother Lukyu that has the donkeys. He is to bring them here for you. Can't we go and fetch them and ride them back?" Said Jack, 
Indeed to goodness. Trevor's brother lives thirty miles away, said Athens. You could not walk there, whatever. You go and see Trevor today and ask him what he has done about your donkeys. Mrs. Mannering and Bill appeared at that moment, looking fresh and trim after their good night's sleep in the sharp mountain air. Any breakfast left for us? said Bill with a grin. Mrs. Evans hurried to fry bacon and eggs again, and soon the big kitchen was full of the savoury smell. Golly, if I stay here and smell that, I shall feel hungry all over again, said Philip. Bill, we're going up to see Trefor the shepherd to ask about our donkeys. Mother, can we have a picnic in the mountains as soon as the donkeys come? Yes, when I'm sure I can keep on my donkey all right, said his mother. If mine's a very fat donkey, I shall slide off. They are not fat, Ethans assured her. They are used in the mountains, and they are strong and small. Sometimes we use ponies, but Trevor's brother breeds donkeys, and they are just as good. Well, we'll go and have a talk with Trevor, said Philip, getting up and letting Snowy fall off his knee. Come on, everyone. Kiki, do you want to be left with the raspberries? You greedy bird. Kiki flew to Jack's shoulder, and the party set off up the path that Ethans had pointed out to them. Snowy bounded with them, turning a deaf ear to his mother's bleats. Already he seemed one of the company, petted by them all, though Kiki was not altogether pleased to have another creature taking up so much of the children's attention. They went up the steep little path. The sun was up higher now and was hot. The children wore only thin blouses or shirts and shorts. But they felt very warm. They came to a spring gushing out of the hillside and sat down to drink and to cool their hands and feet. Snowy drank too and then capered about lightly on his strong little legs, leaping from place to place almost as if he had wings. I wish I could leap like a goat, said Jack lazily. It looks so lovely and easy to spring up high into the air like that and land wherever you want to. Philip suddenly made a grab at something that was slithering past him on the warm bank. Dinah sat up at once. What is it? What is it? This, said Philip, and showed the others a silver grey, snake like creature with bright little eyes. Dinah screamed at once. A snake! Oh, Philip, put it down! Philip, it'll bite you! It won't, said Philip calmly. It's not a snake. And anyway, British snakes don't bite unless they're adders. I've told you that before. This is a slow worm, and a very fine specimen, too. The children looked in fascination as the silvery slow worm wriggled over Philip's knees. It certainly looked very like a snake, but it wasn't. Lucy Ann and Jack knew that, but Dinah always forgot. She was so terrified of snakes that to her anything that glided along must belong to the snake family. It's horrible! She said with a shudder. Let it go, Philip. How do you know it's not a snake? Well, for one thing, it blinks its eyes, and no snake does that, said Philip. Watch it. It blinks like a lizard. And no wonder, because it belongs to the lizard family. As he spoke, the little creature blinked its eyes. It stayed still on Philip's knee and made no further attempt to escape. Philip put his hand over it, and it stayed there quite happy. I've never had a slow worm for a pet, said Philip. I've a good mind. Philip, if you dare to keep that snake for a pet, I'll tell Mother to send you home, said Dinah in great alarm. Dinah, it's not a snake, said Philip impatiently. It's a lizard, a legless lizard, quite harmless and very interesting. I'm going to keep it for a pet if it'll stay with me. Stay with you? Of course it will, said Jack. Did you ever know an animal that wouldn't? I should hate to go to a jungle with you, Philip. You'd have monkeys hanging lovingly round your neck, and tigers purring at you, and snakes wrapping themselves round your legs, and. Diana gave a little scream. Don't say such horrible things! Philip, make that slow worm go away! Instead, he slipped it into his pocket. Now don't worry, Diana, he said. You don't need to come near me. I don't expect it will stay with me because it won't like my pocket, but I'll just see. They set off up the hill once more, Dinah hanging back carefully. Oh dear, Philip would go and spoil the holiday by keeping something horrible again. 
Chapter Four, Up on the Mountainside. Trefor the shepherd had a small cabin-like cottage a good way up the mountainside. Around him for miles grazed the sheep. Nearer in were that year's lambs, now grown into sturdy little beasts, their woolly coats showing up against the sheared bodies of the older sheep. The shepherd was having a simple meal when they got to his hut. He had bread, butter, cream cheese, and onions, and beside him a great jug of milk that he had cooled by standing it in the stream that ran down the mountainside nearby. He nodded his head to the children as they came up. He was a curious-looking old fellow with longish, untidy hair, a straggling beard, and two of the brightest blue eyes the children had ever seen. He spoke Welsh, which they didn't understand. Can you speak English? asked Jack. We can't understand what you say. Trefor knew a few words of English, which, after much thought and munching of onions, he spoke. Donkeys, tomorrow. He added something the children didn't understand and waved his hand down the mountainside towards the farmhouse. He means the donkeys will arrive tomorrow at the farm," said Jack. "Good. Perhaps Aunt Ally and Bill will come for a picnic on the donkeys." Trefor was very interested in Kiki. He had never in his life seen a parrot. He pointed at Kiki and laughed a hoarse laugh. Kiki at once copied it. Trefor looked startled. "Wipe your feet," said Kiki sternly. "How many times have I told you to shut the door? Three blind mice." Trefor stared at the parrot, amazed. Kiki cackled loudly. "Look you, whatever. Look you, whatever. Look." The children laughed. Jack tapped Kiki on the beak. Now, now, Kiki, don't show off. Snowy butted against Philip's legs. He didn't like so much attention being given to Kiki. Philip turned, and the little creature leapt straight into his arms. Trefor seemed most amused and sent out a flood of Welsh words that nobody could understand at all. He tapped Philip on the arm and then pointed to the ground to show the children that he wanted them to sit down. They sat down, wondering what he wanted. He went a little way down the hillside, making a soft baaing noise. From everywhere around, the woolly lambs looked up. They came running to the shepherd, bleating, and even little Snowy left Philip and ran too. The shepherd knelt down, and the lambs crowded round him, nuzzling against him. Trefor had had them when they were tiny. He had looked after them, even fed some of them from bottles if their mothers had died. And when they heard his soft call that once they had known so well, they remembered and came to him, their first friend. A lump came into Lucy Ann's throat. There was something very touching in the sight of that solemn, lonely, long-haired old shepherd calling to his lambs and being answered. Snowy the kid, eager to get close to him, leapt onto the woolly backs of the lambs and butted his head against them. Look at Snowy! Isn't he a cheeky rascal of a kid? Said Dinah, "My goodness, you can hardly see Trefor now. He's so surrounded by lambs." Trefor came back, smiling, his eyes very blue in his old brown face. He offered the children some bread and onions, but the onions were big and strong-smelling, and Jack felt certain Mrs. Mannering wouldn't approve if they all came back smelling strongly of Trefor's onions. "No, thank you," he said politely. "Will you be down to see your brother tomorrow when he brings the donkeys?" Trefor seemed to understand this. He nodded. "I come, tomorrow, donkeys." Getting quite talkative, isn't he? Said Jack to the others. Right, Trefor. See you tomorrow then. They set off down the hill again. They stopped once more at the little spring to drink. They sat on the grass, looking at the towering mountains round them. Evan says that all those mountains over there have hardly anyone living on them because they are difficult to get at," said Jack. "I bet there are some interesting animals and birds there. Wish we could go and see." "I don't see why we shouldn't if Bill and Mother would come with us," said Philip, trying to stop Snowy from walking on his middle. "Stop it, Snowy! Get off my tummy! Your hooves are sharp. It would be fun to go off into the mountains on donkeys and take food with us for a few days." And have tents? Do you mean? Said Jack. I say, that's an idea, Philip. We could take our cameras and get some fine pictures. I might see some rare birds. I bet you would, said Philip. Hello, 
Here comes Sally Slither. Out of his pocket glided the slow worm and curled itself up in the crook of Philip's elbow in the sun. Dinah removed herself to a safe distance at once. Kiki looked down with interest from her perch on Jack's shoulder. Sally Slither, what a nice name, said Lucy Ann, running her finger down the slow worm's silvery back. Look, my finger's tickling her. She's going all dithery. Slithery dithery, said Kiki at once. She had a real talent for putting together words of the same sound. Dithery slithery, slithery dithery. All right, all right, said Philip. We don't want to hear it again, Kiki. You're a clever old bird. We all know that. Jack, look at this slow worm. It's not a scrap frightened now. I do think you're mean to keep it. Began Dinah from a safe distance. You know how I hate snakes. All right, all right. I know it isn't a snake, though I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it bit me if I came near it. So there. I wouldn't be surprised at anything biting you when you're so nervous," said Philip crossly. "I feel like biting you myself. Come here, Dinah. Run your fingers down Sally Slither's back. Look at her sharp little eyes." Dinah gave a scream. "I couldn't bear it." No, don't come near me, Philip. It's worse than those awful white rats you had a few months ago. But at least they grew up, and you let them go. Sally can go whenever she wants to," said Philip. "I never keep any pet when it wants to go. Do you want to go, Sally Slither? Slithery dithery, musty dusty fusty," said Kiki, trying to remember the various collections of words she had picked up at one time or another. Puffin and puffin, come on, let's go. Said Dinah, "Perhaps that horrible thing will go back into your pocket if we go, and I'm getting hungry." The slow worm slid back somewhere in Philip's clothes. He got up, and Snowy bounded round him. "Now just see if you can walk without getting your head between my legs all the time," said Philip to Snowy. "You'll send me flying in a minute. You're a bit too friendly at times, Snowy." They went back to the farmhouse, enjoying the sunshine and the constant breeze that blew over the mountainside. By the time they reached the farmhouse, they were all terribly hungry, and visions of ham, chicken, salad, and raspberries and cream kept coming into their minds. Bill and Mrs. Mannering had been for a walk too, but down the mountain, not up. They had been back for a little while and were just beginning to wonder where the children were. Snowy went bounding up to them. He's a pet. Said Mrs. Mannering, "I suppose we shall have him at our heels the whole of this holiday. Now, it's a pity kids have to grow up into goats. Don't think you're going to take Snowy back home with you, Philip. I'm not going to have a goat in the garden whilst you're at school, eating the vegetables out of the beds and the clothes off the line. Mother, Trefor says his brother will arrive at the farmhouse tomorrow with the donkeys," said Philip. "Can we each choose our own? How many will there be? Yes, you can choose your own if you want to." Said Mrs. Mannering, "I don't know how many there will be, six, I suppose. I only hope I choose a sure-footed one." They'll all be sure-footed," said Jack, "as sure-footed as goats, but not so leapy. I shouldn't care to ride one of these mountain goats and find myself leaping about from rock to rock." "Good gracious! What a horrible thought," said Mrs. Mannering. "I shall choose the quietest, staidest, placidest, best-tempered donkey of the lot." One without a single bound or leap in him. Everyone laughed. Effens came over to them, beaming to see them happy. It is dinner time, he said. Mrs. Effens has it ready. I shall soon begin to talk in a sing-song voice myself," said Lucy Ann, getting up from the stone wall. Indeed, to goodness I shall. They all laughed at the lilting way she spoke. Snowy galloped ahead into the kitchen. Mrs. Evans didn't seem to mind at all, but she shooed him down when he leapt into a chair. A hen scuttled out from under the table. Kiki went up to a rafter, sat on a ham wrapped up in a cloth, and cocked her eye down to the table to see what fruit there was. Pop goes the weasel," she announced, and made a popping noise like a cork coming out of a bottle. Evans looked up in admiration. "Such a bird," he said. "Never have I seen such a bird. Look you." Kiki began hiccuping, and Effens went off into a roar of laughter. Mrs. Mannering frowned. "Kiki, stop that! How many times am I to tell you I don't like that noise?" 
How many times have I told you to wipe your feet? Retorted Kiki and screeched. Ethan's almost died of laughter. Kiki began to show off, snapping her beak open and shut, putting her crest up and down, and making peculiar noises. Kiki, come here," said Jack sternly, and Kiki flew down to his shoulder. Jack tapped her smartly on her beak. "Any more nonsense from you, and I'll shut you in the bedroom upstairs." Bad bird, silly bird. Poor Polly, bad Polly," said Kiki, and nipped Jack's ear. He smacked her on the beak again. "Be quiet! Not another word!" he ordered. Kiki put her head under her wing in disgrace, and various whispering sounds came to everyone's ears, but nobody could hear what she said. Though Ethan strained his ears hopefully, what a bird! He wished he could have one like it. The dinner was as good as the high tea and breakfast had been. The children set to work, and Mrs. Evans felt very pleased to see how much her good food was appreciated. She kept pressing second and third helpings on everyone, but soon even the boys could eat no more. There is no four o'clock tea, she kept saying. Nothing till six o'clock. So eat, look you, eat. Dither is leathery, announced Kiki suddenly, and Diana gave a scream. The slow worm was gliding out of Philip's sleeve. He pushed it back hurriedly, hoping that no one had seen it. Bill had, his sharp eyes had caught sight of it at once. He grinned. Another member added to the family, he said. Very nice too. What with Snowy and Kiki and、uh, Slithery, we look all set for a most interesting holiday. Chapter Five. Arrival of the donkeys. The next excitement, of course, was the arrival of the donkeys. The children had waited expectantly for them all the following morning, not liking to go for a walk in case they missed the donkeys' arrival. Lucy Ann saw them first. She gave a yell that sent the slow worm back into Philip's pocket and startled Snowy so much that he leapt four feet in the air. Even Kiki jumped. The donkeys! cried Lucy Ann. There they come! Look up the mountain path. Soon, all four children were tearing down the path to the donkeys. There were eight of them, strong, sturdy little creatures with big, bright eyes and long tails that whisked the flies away. They were all grey, and their long ears twitched to and fro as they came steadily up the steep path. Trefor's brother David was with them, an elderly man, rather like Trefor, but with tidier hair and beard. He had the same bright blue eyes, but he looked timid and shy, as if the world had not been kind to him. He smiled faintly at the lively children. "Can we ride four of the donkeys now?" asked Philip. "We know how to ride. Come on, Lucy Ann, up with you." He gave Lucy Ann a shove, and she was up on a donkey's back. Dinah needed no help. With a leap like Snowy's, she was up at once. The donkeys ambled up the steep path with the children. Refusing to trot now that they had heavy weights on their backs, Snowy galloped beside Philip's donkey, half jealous of it, butting it in the legs. "Hello, here we are!" cried Jack, ambling up to Mrs. Mannering and Bill. "Eight donkeys to choose from. Which are you going to have, Aunt Ally?" David stood by, smiling, whilst his donkeys were examined and tried. Trefor the shepherd arrived, and the two old brothers chatted together in Welsh. Ephens and his wife came along, and soon there was quite a company in the farmyard discussing the donkeys. We badly want to go off on the donkeys into the mountains, mother," said Philip coaxingly. "Can we? With you and Bill, of course. To stay a few nights, I mean. Jack and I think there should be a fine lot of rare birds over there in those lonely mountains, and there will be lots of animals too. It would be rather fun," said his mother. "I haven't camped out for ages." And in this weather, it would be lovely. What do you say, Bill? I say yes," said Bill, who loved outdoor life and was an old hand at camping. Do you good, Ally. We could take a couple of extra donkeys to carry the things we want. Oh, Bill, can we really go?" said Lucy Ann, overjoyed, and Dinah danced round him too. To go off on donkeys into the mountains and take tents and food, what could be more fun? It will be an adventure," said Dinah. "Not one of our usual ones, of course, but a really nice one. 
You'll like that, Lucianne, won't you? Oh, yes, said Lucianne, who never really enjoyed a proper adventure whilst it was happening. I'd like that kind of adventure. When can we go? Well, we'd better get used to our donkeys before we think of going, said Bill. I'm not used to donkey riding, nor is Aunt Allie. We shall be stiff at first, so we'd better get over that stage before we go. Say, next week? Oh, I can't wait that long, said Dinah, and the others laughed at her long face. Ethans, where is a nice place to go? asked Jack, turning to him. Ethans considered. He spoke to Trefor in Welsh, and the old shepherd answered him. He says the Vale of Butterflies is a good place, said Ethans. It is full of birds as well as butterflies. The Vale of Butterflies! That sounds gorgeous, said Jack, pleased. Super, said Philip. Absolutely wizard. We'll go there. Is it far? Two days on donkeys, said Evans. Bill calculated. We shall want a guide. Either Trefor, Evans, or Trefor's brother, and two donkeys at least to carry our tents and food, and six donkeys for ourselves. That's nine. We've only got eight here. Evans, ask this fellow if he's got another donkey. It turned out that Trefor's brother had meant to ride home on a donkey himself and take another donkey back with farm produce to sell, leaving only six. Ethans bargained with him to come back the next week, complete with three donkeys to add to the six left behind. Then you can act as guide to these people, look you, he said. That'll be money. You will have one donkey, they will have six, and there will be two for loads. That is much money for you, David, indeed to goodness. David agreed. He would come on the Wednesday of next week, bringing three donkeys to add to the six he would leave behind. Two to carry loads, one for himself, and six for the children, Mrs. Mannering and Bill. The children were very excited. They ran round the donkeys, patted them, rubbed their long noses, and sat on their broad backs. The donkeys seemed to like all the fuss. They stood stolidly there, their tails whisking, following the children with their eyes. Snowy darted about, running under first one donkey and then another, acting like a mad thing. Trefor helped his brother to load up a donkey with packages of all kinds. Heavier and heavier grew the load, but the donkey stood patiently, seeming not to mind at all. Then, eager to be gone, it suddenly brayed. Kiki had never heard a donkey bray before, and she sailed straight up into the air with fright. <coughs> prayed the donkey, and stamped his foot. Gracious! Now I suppose Kiki will practice braying, too, said Jack. We shall have to stop her firmly if she does. It's bad enough from a donkey, but brays from Kiki would be frightful. The donkey was loaded at last. David mounted his sturdy little beast, said a polite goodbye to everyone, and rode off down the path, the loaded donkey being led after him by a rope he held in his hand. Now we can choose our own donkeys, said Lucianne in delight. Aunt Allie, you choose first. Well, they all look exactly alike to me, said Mrs. Mannering. Bill spoke to Ethans, asking him if he knew which donkey was the quietest. Ethans turned to Trefor. Trefor knew. He pointed out a little creature with a patient expression in its eyes, and said a few words in Welsh. He says that is the one for you said Ephans. It is quiet and good. Its name is Patience. Oh, good. I'll choose her, then, said Mrs. Mannering. This is mine, children, the one with the black mark on her forehead. I want this one, cried Lucy Anne, pulling at a sturdy animal that threw its head back continually, and stamped now and then. I like him. What is his name, Trefor? Trefor said something nobody understood. Ephans translated. His name is Clover. This one is Grayling, and that one is Dapple. The other two are Buttercup and Daisy. Lucy Ann had Clover, Jack had Grayling, and Dinah had Dapple. Bill had Buttercup, and Philip had Daisy. Each of them was delighted with his or her own special donkey. Let's ride them now, said Jack, mounting his little beast. Come on, Bill. Aunt Allie, get on. We'll go for our first ride now. Up the path and back again. With Evans and his wife looking on in delight, 
the six rode off on their donkeys. They would not go fast uphill, and Bill warned each child not to try and make them. They'll trot coming down all right, he said, but it's heavy going for them uphill with our weight on their backs. It was great fun riding the grey donkeys up the steep mountain path. Mrs. Nannering was nervous at first when she came to the rocky bits, but her donkey was as sure-footed as the others and went steadily along on even the stoniest parts. Bill rode close by in case Mrs. Mannering needed help, but she didn't. The four children, of course, would have scorned any help. They were all used to riding horses, and the donkeys were very easy to manage. Now we'll turn back, called Bill. So they all turned and went homewards. Snowy came too, of course, having leapt and bounded ahead of them all the way, apparently under the impression that he was leading them. That was fun! said Lucy Ann as they trotted homewards, the donkeys going faster now that they were on a downhill road. Mrs. Mannering didn't like the trotting so much as the ambling. My donkey is a very bumpy one, she said to Bill. When I go down, she comes up, and when I go up, she goes down, so we keep meeting with a bump. Everyone laughed. They were all sorry when they reached the farmhouse, for by that time they felt as if they could go trotting on forever. But a meal was ready for them on the table, and Mrs. Evans was beaming at the door, so they didn't lose much time in taking the donkeys to the field and carrying their harness to the stables. "'You'll be quite used to riding a donkey by next week,' Bill said to Mrs. Mannering. "'By the time Wednesday comes, you'll be ready to set off and you'll feel as if you'd ridden a donkey all your life.' "'Oh, yes, I'm sure I shall,' said Mrs. Mannering. She felt something pecking at her foot and looked under the table. She saw a fat brown hen there and pushed it away. Shoo! Stop pecking my foot! The hen shooed, only to be replaced by Snowy, who, pushed off Philip's knee as he sat at the table, was amusing himself by trying to eat shoelaces under the table. Mrs. Mannering pushed him away too, and Snowy went to chew the hem of Mrs. Evans's dress. She never noticed things like that, so Snowy had a nice long chew. The next day... The girls and Mrs. Mannering were so stiff from their donkey ride that they could hardly walk. The boys and Bill were all right, but Mrs. Mannering groaned as she came down the stairs. Good gracious! I feel like an old lady! I'll never be able to ride a donkey again! she said. But the stiffness wore off, and the six of them soon got used to riding their donkeys day after day into the mountains. There were some lovely rides and magnificent views. Snowy came with them always, never tired, leaping along gaily. Kiki rode on Jack's shoulder, occasionally taking a flight into the air to scare any bird that happened to be flying overhead. They flew off quickly, full of astonishment when Kiki told them to wipe their feet. Two days more and it's Wednesday, said Lucy Ann happily. We'll be quite ready then, able to ride for hours and hours. Yes, off to the Vale of Butterflies said Jack. I wonder what it's like. I imagine it to be full of wings of all colours. Lovely. Oh, hurry up and come, Wednesday, said Dinah. Only forty-eight hours, and then off we go. But something unexpected happened in that forty-eight hours, something that quite upset their lovely plans. Chapter 6 off to the Vale of Butterflies. It happened the very next day. It was when Mrs. Mannering had gone with Mrs. Evans to the big barn. The door suddenly blew shut and caught her hand in it, trapping it tightly. Mrs. Mannering screamed. Mrs. Evans ran to open the door, but poor Mrs. Mannering's hand was badly bruised and crushed. Bill was very concerned. I must take you down to the doctor, he said. I'll get the car. Where are the children? Out on their donkeys? Tell them where we've gone, Mrs. Evans, when they come back. They needn't worry. I'll have Mrs. Mannering's hand seen to, and properly bandaged. I don't expect it'll be very much, but I'd like her to have it x-rayed in case any small bone is broken. Looking rather white, Mrs. Mannering was driven off by Bill, down the steep mountain road to the town that lay some way off in the next valley. It was about fifteen miles, and soon Mrs. Mannering was in hospital, having her hand x-rayed and bound up. The children were very upset when they heard what had happened. 
Poor mother, said Philip. It must have hurt dreadfully when her hand got caught in that heavy door. Indeed to goodness it did, said Mrs. Evans, who looked quite upset too. She gave one scream, poor soul, and then made not a sound whatever. Now don't look so sadly. She'll be back tonight. Will she be able to go off into the mountains tomorrow? asked Lucy Ann. How can she ride with a bad hand? Well, there now, she can't, said Mrs. Evans. But she can stay here with me, and I'll look after her for you. You can go with Mr. Cunningham and David. But will Bill go if mother's hurt? wondered Philip. He thinks the world of her. Oh, blow! It's bad luck for this to happen just when we had such a lovely plan. Poor mother! I do hope her hand's better now. Mrs. Mannering arrived back in Bill's car that evening, just before high tea. She looked better and made light of her hand. We've had it x rayed, said Bill. She's broken a tiny bone just here, and he showed them where on the back of his hand. It's got to be bandaged and kept at rest. I'm to take her down to have it seen again in three days' time. I'm so sorry, dears, said Mrs. Mannering. And Bill, you don't need to take me down, you know. I'm quite able to drive myself down, even with an injured hand. Take the children on their trip tomorrow. I can't bear to have them disappointed. What? And leave you like this? said Bill. Don't be silly, Ally. I shall take you down myself in the car on Friday. The children can go with David if he'll take them on by himself. It's a perfectly ordinary trip, and they'll be back in a few days' time. They can all ride their donkeys as easily as David, and probably they'll enjoy a trip without us. We'd much rather you and Aunt Ally came, said Jack. But as you can't, it's decent of you to let us go alone. We'll be perfectly all right, Bill. David knows the way, and we can all look after ourselves. So it was settled that the four children should go by themselves on the donkeys with their guide, David, taking with them tents, bedding, and food. Philip questioned Bill to make sure that his mother's hand was not seriously hurt. Oh, no, it will soon be right, said Bill. But I want to be sure she doesn't use it, and I want to take her down to the doctor in three days' time. I'm sorry not to come with you. But you'll be all right by yourselves. I don't see that you can get into any trouble or any startling adventure going donkey riding in the mountains with David. Maybe we can all go together later on. The children were very excited that night, getting ready the things they wanted to take. They had two small tents, a sleeping bag each, two ground sheets, cameras, field glasses, a change of clothes, and food. The food was Mrs. Evans's care. Bill watched her packing up what she thought they would eat in the next few days. I didn't like to stop her, he told the others. But honestly, she's packed enough for a month. She's put in a whole ham. Golly, said Jack. What else? A tongue or two, hard boiled eggs, tins of all kinds, plum cake, and goodness knows what, said Philip. We shall feast like kings. Well, began Lucy Ann. I always think that we eat twice as much in the open air because food tastes so much nicer, chorused everyone. Lucy Ann always said that at least a dozen times each holidays. She laughed. Well, anyway, it will be nice to have as much as ever we can eat. There's David, too. We've got to take food for him as well. He doesn't look as if he'd eat much, said Dinah. Skinny little fellow he is. You'd better go to bed early, children. Said Mrs. Mannering a little later. You have a long ride tomorrow, according to Evans. All right, it'll make tomorrow come all the sooner, said Lucy Ann. How does your hand feel, Aunt Ally? It's quite comfortable, thank you, said Mrs. Mannering. I'm sure I could have gone with you tomorrow, really. Well, you couldn't, said Bill hastily, half afraid that Mrs. Mannering would try to be foolish and go with the others after all. She laughed. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going to be sensible. And dear me, it will be quite a change to be rid of four noisy ruffians and an even noisier bird for a few days, Bill, won't it? All the children were awake very early the next day. Snowy the kid, who was a real sleepy head in the mornings, didn't want to wake up at all and snuggled deeper into Philip's blankets as the boy tried to get out of bed. Kiki took her head from under her wing and scratched her pole. Dithery slithery! 
she remarked, which meant that she had spied Philip's slow worm. It was coiled up in a corner of the room. It would very much have liked to sleep on Philip's bed, but it was afraid of Snowy, who had a habit of nibbling anything near him. The boys got up and looked out of the window. It was a really perfect day. The mountains towered up into the fresh morning sky, as beautiful as ever. They look as if someone had just been along and washed them, said Jack. The sky looks washed too, so very, very clean and new. I like the feel of an early morning, said Philip, putting on his shorts. It has a special new feel about it, as if it was the first morning that had ever happened. Snowy went over to the corner where Sally the slow worm was, and the slow worm at once wriggled away under the chest of drawers. Philip picked her up, and she slid gracefully into his pocket. Have to get you a few flies for breakfast, Sally, said Philip. Shut up, Kiki. You'll wake the rest of the household with that awful cough. Kiki could give a terrible, hollow cough at times, which she had copied from an old uncle of Jack's, and she was practicing it now. She stopped when Philip spoke to her and hopped to Jack's shoulder. Funny bird, silly bird, said Jack affectionately, scratching her neck. Come on, Philip, let's see if the girls are up. They were just getting up, both of them thrilled at the fine day and the idea of going camping in the mountains. Have you got that horrid slow worm on you? asked Dinah fearfully, looking at Philip. Yes, somewhere about, said Philip. Feeling all over him. There's one thing about Sally Slithery, she does get about. Dinah shuddered and went to wash in the bathroom. Snowy the kid was there, nibbling the cork bath mat, which he evidently thought was delicious. Oh, Snowy! Mrs. Evans won't be at all pleased with you, said Dinah, and shooed the kid out of the door. He went to find Philip. He was quite one of the family now. Mrs. Mannering's hand was stiff and sore that morning, but she said very little about it, not wanting to upset the children. She was glad it was such a lovely day for them, and watched with amusement as Mrs. Evans carefully packed up all the food she had prepared for the children to take with them. If you eat all that, you'll never be able to ride home on the donkeys, she said. You'll be too fat. They must not go hungry, said kind Mrs. Evans. There, I think I have thought of everything. Children, you must use one donkey for the food and the other for everything else, look you. I will see that David straps everything on well. The children listened to her kind, lilting voice as they sat at breakfast. They felt very happy, and the only thing that spoilt their pleasure was the fact that Bill and Mrs. Mannering were not coming with them. On the other hand, they would be freer without grown ups. Kiki gave a hiccup with one eye on Mrs. Mannering. She looked at the parrot severely. Kiki, you did that on purpose. Do you want your beak smacked? Pardon? said Kiki, and went off into a cackle of laughter. Effens choked over his bacon, trying to laugh with his mouth full, and went purple in the face. His bacon went down the wrong way, and he got the hiccups too. Pardon, look you, he said to Mrs. Mannering, with such a horrified look on his face that everyone roared with laughter. Now here is David all ready for you, cried Mrs. Evans from the door, where she had gone to chase away a turkey that had suddenly appeared. It made a gobbling noise that scared Snowy terribly. Kiki, of course, at once gobbled too, and the turkey looked into the kitchen in amazement. Shoo! said Mrs. Evans. Good morning, David. It's early you are, and a nice day you have brought with you. Indeed, to goodness I have, said David. And smiled timidly at the company in the big kitchen. His donkeys crowded round him, sturdy and patient, their harness clinking and glinting. Come on! yelled Jack, suddenly feeling too excited to sit at the table any longer. Come on! Let's pack the things on the donkeys and go! They all rushed out. Soon David and Effens were strapping everything on two donkeys. One donkey had big panniers each side for food. The other had the thing strapped across his broad little back. They stood perfectly still, their ears twitching as a fly or two settled on them. Well, are we ready to start? said Philip. I think we've got everything. Oh gosh, where are my field glasses? At last, everyone and everything was ready. It had been explained to David that Bill and Mrs. Mannering could not come, 
and Ethans had said he would care for the two extra donkeys till the children came back. David did not seem too pleased to think he was to go alone with the children. He looked rather alarmed, Bill thought. Poor fellow. Bill wished it was Ethans who was going with the children, not David. Still, the children were used to camping out and could be trusted to be sensible. Goodbye, called everyone. See you in a few days' time. Take care of your hand, mother. Now we're off. Off to the Vale of Butterflies. Goodbye, everyone. Chapter 7 On the Way With Bill, Mrs. Mannering, Ethans and Mrs. Evans waving and calling goodbye, the party set off on their donkeys. They had to go up by Trefor the shepherd's little cabin, and the donkeys picked their way steadily up the steep hillside. Snowy ran beside them, bobbing about under the donkeys' bodies as he pleased. They seemed to like him, and Dapple kept putting his head down to the kid whenever he came near. Kiki was perched as usual on Jack's shoulder, jogging up and down contentedly, snapping her beak and making a few quiet remarks into Jack's ear. They came to Trefor's cabin. He was on the hillside, seeing to a sick sheep. He came to meet them, his untidy hair blowing in the wind, and his eyes shining as blue as forget-me-nots. There was a conversation between the two men in Welsh. David sounded rather complaining. Trefor seemed to be poo-pooing what he said. David got out a map that Bill had given him, and appeared to be saying that he didn't understand it at all. Trefor then spoke earnestly, pointing in this direction and that, poking David with his finger every time he wanted to make a point go home. The children thought he must be telling David the exact way to go. "'I hope David really does know the way,' said Jack. "'He might have thought Bill would help him with the map if Bill had been going. "'It looks to me as if he's telling Trefor he's not too certain of the way.' "'Well, what does it matter?' said Philip, "'pushing Snowy off with his hand as the kid tried to jump up onto his donkey with him. "'I'd like to see the Vale of Butterflies, "'but so long as we go off camping in those gorgeous mountains, that's all that matters.' "'Yes, we shall see heaps of birds and animals anyway,' said Jack, feeling that Philip was right. "'Come on, David, let's go!' David leapt onto his donkey at once. He called goodbye to Trefor, and the little company set off once more, taking a narrow path along the mountainside that went neither very far up nor very far down. It was glorious riding there, so high, looking down on the valley far below. It was partly in the sun and partly in the shadow, for the sun was not yet high. Swallows flew round them, catching flies, their steel-blue wings gleaming in the sun. Kiki watched them out of her sharp eyes. She had often tried fly-catching herself, but she knew she was no good at it. Anyway, flies didn't taste as good as fruit. They ambled on until everyone felt hungry and thirsty. They came to a copse of birch trees with a small stream nearby. "'Let's picnic here,' said Philip, sliding off his donkey. "'In the shade of those trees. I'm absolutely cooked with the sun.' David saw to the donkeys, taking them to the stream for water. He then let them wander free, for they came most obediently at his call and could be trusted not to go too far away. They went to the shade of the trees and stood there, swishing their long grey tails, enjoying the rest. Snowy ran to them and behaved like a spoilt child, letting the donkeys fuss him and stare at him. Dapple put down his big head to the little kid and nuzzled him in the neck. When Snowy ran to the next donkey, Dapple followed him. "'Dapple wants to be friends with Snowy,' said Dinah, unpacking the lunch parcel from one of the enormous panniers. "'Here, Lucianne, take this tin and fill it with water from the stream. It must be absolutely pure, I should think.' We can put some of this lemonade essence with it. I'm so dreadfully thirsty. David was drinking at the stream, so the children felt that it must be all right. It gurgled along, fresh and clear, running through the pebbles and down the hillside at top speed. Lucy Ann went to fill the tin. There was a lovely lunch. The children had to call David to share it because he suddenly seemed shy. He came and sat down a little way away from them. "'No, David, come here with us,' called Jack, patting the ground. "'We want to learn Welsh. Come and talk to us.' But the old Welshman was very shy 
and it was as much as the children could do to persuade him to eat his share of the lunch. It was such a good lunch too. There were five different kinds of sandwiches: fresh lettuce wrapped in a damp cloth, hard-boiled eggs to nibble, and great slices of jam tart, washed down with cold lemonade. It was the finest lunch anyone could wish. Nobody in the whole world, not even the very richest king, can possibly have a nicer lunch than this," said Lucy Ann, munching a chicken sandwich. "Or a nicer place to eat it in," said Philip, waving his sandwich at the magnificent view before them. "Look at that! No king could have a better view from his palace than that. Valleys and mountains, and yet more mountains, and then the clear blue sky. Marvelous!" They all gazed at the unbelievable view that lay in front of them. A rustle of paper made them look round. Snowy, you greedy little kid! Look here, he's eaten the rest of the chicken sandwiches! Cried Jack indignantly, forgetting all about the lovely view. Philip, smack him! We can't let him do that, or our food won't last out. He can jolly well eat the grass. Philip gave Snowy a smart tap on the nose. The kid retreated in a huff. Taking with him a mouthful of sandwich papers, which he proceeded to eat with apparent enjoyment, but soon he was back with Philip, pressing against him affectionately, anxious to be back in his good books. Dapple the donkey moved over to Philip too to be near the kid. He lay down beside him, and Philip at once leaned back against him. "Thanks, old man. Very nice. Just what I wanted," said Philip, and everyone laughed as he settled himself against the donkey's side. Have another sandwich, David," asked Lucy Ann, holding out a packet to him. David had not eaten nearly as much as they had, either through shyness or because he hadn't such an enormous appetite. He shook his head. "Let's have a bit of a rest now," said Philip sleepily. "There's no hurry. We can take all the time we like to get anywhere." Jack began to ask David the names of things in Welsh. It was silly not to be able to talk to David. David apparently understood more English than he spoke, but even the few English words he said were pronounced so differently that the children found it hard to puzzle out what he was saying. "Come on, David, talk," said Jack, who did not feel as sleepy as the others. "What's this in Welsh?" He held out his hand. David began to realize that Jack wanted a lesson in Welsh, and he brightened up a little. He was a trifle embarrassed by Kiki, who insisted on repeating all the words he said too, and added a few nonsense words of her own for good measure. The girls and Philip fell asleep in the shade, Lucy Ann sharing Philip's donkey to lean against. Dinah would have liked to do the same, but she was afraid that Sally the slow worm might come out of Philip's pocket if she did, and nothing would make Dinah go near the silvery creature. Jack patiently tried to learn a few Welsh words. And then got tired of it. He threw a few pebbles down the mountainside and gazed round at the many summits towering up in the distance. There was one odd one shaped like three teeth that amused him. He decided to look it up on the map. The map, however, was rather disappointing. It showed very few names in the district where they were, probably because it had been very little visited, and there were no farmhouses or other buildings to put on record. Jack found a name that seemed to him to fit the mountain. Thang Mountain, he read. That might be it. Gosh, what a lot of mountains there are about here! I bet nobody has ever explored them all. I'd like to fly over them in an aeroplane and look down on them. We haven't seen a plane since we've been here. Off the route, I suppose. David had gone round to round up the donkeys. Jack woke up the others. Come on, lazy things. We'd better get on, or David will think we mean to camp here for the night. There's a heavenly wind got up now. It'll be gorgeous riding this afternoon. Soon they were all on their donkeys again, jogging along round the mountainside, enjoying the wind and the sun, gazing on the different vistas that opened up before them round every bend of the track. New mountains reared up far away heads. New skylines appeared. For long stretches, the children said nothing at all to one another. But simply drank in the beauty around them and the sun and the wind. They travelled until six o'clock, having decided to keep to the high tea that Mrs. Evans had at the farm. Jack spoke to David when six o'clock came. David, we stop at half past six. Do you know a good place to camp for the night near here? 
David did not understand, and Jack repeated it more slowly. David smiled and nodded. Hiss, hiss. This meant yes, and Jack looked as David pointed to a wooded spot some way ahead. David said something else in Welsh, and Jack caught a few words here and there which he understood. One was water, the other was trees. David says there's a good place to camp a little way off. Jack shouted back to the others. There's water there and trees. Gosh, however, do you understand him? Said Philip in admiration. Jolly clever of you, Jack. Jack grinned all over his freckled face. Oh, I just caught the words water and trees. That's all. Come on, let's get there in time to watch the sun sink over the mountains. I'd like to have a sunset with my sandwiches. Philip laughed. They all ambled on towards the spot pointed out by David. It was a little further than they thought, but when they got there, they all agreed it was just the right place to camp for the night. A spring gushed out beside the small wooded patch as cold as ice. The trees sheltered the campers from the night wind, which could be very chilly at times. The donkeys were to be tied to trees so that they would not wander in the night. Everything was perfect. The children were tired but happy. They slid off their donkeys' backs, and the little beasts, tired now too, were taken to the spring to drink. They stood patiently waiting their turn, whilst Snowy skipped about like a mad thing, not in the least tired with his long trip. "We'll put up the tents after we've had a meal and rest," said Philip. "Get out the food, Lucy Ann and Dinah. There's a nice flat stone here we can use as a table." Soon the supper or high tea was spread out on the big flat stone. And mugs of lemonade were set by each plate. The children drained them at once, and Jack was sent to get more ice cold water from the spring. They all ate quickly, for they were very hungry again. They said very little until the first edge of their appetite had worn off. Then they all talked with their mouths full, eager to make the others remember the lovely day. David ate too and listened. The donkeys pulled at the grass. Snowy was with Dapple. And Kiki was eating a tomato and dripping the juice down Jack's neck. They all felt as if they couldn't possibly be happier. Now we'll put up the tents," said Jack at last. "Come on, Philip. It'll be dark before we've put them up if we don't make haste." Chapter Eight. First night in camp. The girls washed the dirty crockery in the cold spring water. Whilst David and the boys unpacked the tents from the donkey that carried them, they took off the whole of his pack and also unstrapped the heavy panniers from the other donkey. Both were delighted to be rid of their loads. They lay down on the ground and rolled, kicking their legs up into the air. Kiki couldn't understand this at all and flew up into a tree. <laughs> She thinks they've gone mad," said Jack. "It's all right, Kiki. They're only feeling glad because their packs have gone." Kiki made a noise like a train screeching in a tunnel, and the two rolling donkeys leapt to their feet in alarm and raced some way down the hill. David also jumped violently and then called to the donkeys, "Kiki, if you do that again, I'll tie your beak up!" threatened Jack, spoiling this lovely, peaceful evening with that horrible screech. "Wipe your feet! Wipe your feet!" screamed Kiki and danced from foot to foot on her branch. The tents were soon put up side by side. David did not want to sleep in one; he preferred to sleep outside. He had never slept in a tent, and he thought they were quite unnecessary. Well, I'd just as soon he slept outside," said Jack to Philip. "I don't believe there'd be room for one more in here, do you?" "Let's leave the tent flaps open," said Lucy Ann, coming up with the clean crockery. "Then we can look out down the mountain side." I wouldn't mind a bit sleeping in the open air, like David. As a matter of fact, wind's too cold," said Jack. "You'll be glad to have a cosy sleeping bag, Lucy Ann. David must be very hardy. He's only got a thin rug to cover himself with, and he's apparently going to sleep on the bare ground." The sun had now disappeared completely. It had gone behind the mountains in a perfect blaze of colour, and all the summits had gleamed for a while, and then darkness had crept up to the very tops. Leaving only a clear sky beyond, stars were now winking here and there, and a cold wind was blowing up the mountain. The donkeys were tied loosely to trees; some of them were lying down. 
Dapple was looking out for Snowy, but the kid had gone to Philip and was waiting for him to go into his tent. They all washed at the spring, but David seemed rather astonished to see the four children solemnly splashing themselves with the cold water. He had drawn his thin rug over him and was lying quite still, looking up to the starry sky. He's not what you might call a very cheerful companion, is he? said Jack. I expect he thinks we're all quite mad the way we joke and laugh and fool about. Buck up, Philip, and get into the tent. The girls were already in their tent. They had slid down into their sleeping bags and tied them up loosely at the neck. Each bag had a big hood to come over the head. They were comfortable, quite roomy, and very warm. Lucy Ann could see out of the tent opening. Stars twinkled in the sky, looking very big and bright. There was no sound at all except the trickle trickle of the spring and the sound of the wind in the trees. We might be alone in the world, said Lucy Ann to Dinah. Dinah, imagine that we are. It gives you an awfully queer feeling. It's wizard. But Dinah hadn't got Lucy Ann's imagination, and she yawned. Go to sleep, she said. Are the boys in their tent yet? I wish they were a bit further away. I've got an awful feeling that slow worm will come slithering here in the night. It won't hurt you if it does, said Lucy Ann, snuggling down in her sleeping bag. Oh, this is super. I do think we have lovely holes, don't you, Dinah? But Dinah was asleep already. Her eyes had shut, and she was dreaming. Lucy Ann stayed awake a little longer, enjoying the sound of the running spring and the wind. She still felt rather as if she was on her donkey, jogging up and down. Then her eyes closed too. The boys talked for a little while. They had thoroughly enjoyed their day. They gazed out of the open flap of the tent. It's pretty wild and desolate here, said Jack sleepily. It's surprising there's a track to follow, really. Decent of Bill and Aunt Allie to let us come by ourselves. Hmm, said Philip. Listening, but too sleepy to answer. Hmm, imitated Kiki from the top of the tent outside. It was too hot for her in it. There's Kiki, said Jack. I wondered where she was. Philip, aren't you hot with Snowy on top of you? Hmm, said Philip. And again there came the echo from the tent top. Hmm. Snowy was almost on top of Philip. He had tried his hardest to squeeze into the boy's sleeping bag with him, but Philip was quite firm about that. If you think you're going to stick your sharp little hooves into me all night long, you're wrong, Snowy, he said, and tied up his bag firmly at the neck in case Snowy should try any tricks in the night. The slow worm was somewhere about too. Philip was too sleepy to bother to think where. Sally slid about where she pleased. Philip was now quite used to the sudden slithering movement that occurred at times somewhere about his body, which meant that Sally was on the move again. There were a few more quiet remarks from Kiki, who was apparently talking to herself. Then silence. The little camp slept under the stars. The night wind nosed into the tent, but could not get into the cosy sleeping bags. Snowy felt too hot, walked over Philip, trod on Jack, and went to lie in the tent opening. He gave a tiny bleat, and Kiki bleated in answer. David was up and about before the children the next day. He was looking at his donkeys when Philip put a tousled head out of the tent opening to sniff at the morning. Lovely, he said. Stop butting me, Snowy. Your little head is jolly hard. Jack, stir yourself. It's a gorgeous morning. Soon all the campers were out of their sleeping bags and running about. They splashed at the spring, laughing at nothing. Snowy bounded everywhere, quite mad too. Kiki hooted like a car and startled the donkeys. Even David smiled to see such early morning antics. They had breakfast, tongue, cream cheese and rather stale bread, with a tomato each. There was no lemonade left because they had been so lavish with it the day before, so they drank the cold spring water and vowed it was just as nice as lemonade. David, shall we get to the Vale of Butterflies today? asked Jack, and then repeated it again slowly, flapping his arms to show David that he was talking about butterflies. 
It took David a minute or two to realize this. Then he shook his head. Tomorrow, asked Philip, and David nodded. He went to strap the packs on the donkeys again and to put on the big pannier baskets. All the little grey creatures were waiting impatiently to set off. Already the sun was getting well above the mountains, and for David and the donkeys at any rate, it was late. They set off at last, though Jack had to gallop back to get his field glasses, which he had left behind, hanging from a tree branch. Then they were all in a line, one donkey behind the other, ambling over the mountains with the wind in their hair. Jack felt sure he saw a couple of buzzards that day, and rode most of the time with his field glasses in his hand, ready to clap them to his eyes at the first sight of specks in the sky. The others saw red squirrels among the trees they passed, shy but tame. One shared the children's lunch, darting up for titbits, but keeping a wary eye for Kiki and Snowy. It wants to come with you, Philip, said Lucianne, amused when the red squirrel put a paw on Philip's knee. Philip stroked the pretty little thing gently. It quivered, half frightened, but did not bound away. Then Kiki swooped down, and the squirrel fled. You would spoil things, you jealous bird, said Philip. Go away, I don't want you. Go to Jack and let the squirrels come to me. Swallows flew round them once again, not attracted by the food, but by the flies that pestered the donkeys. The children could hear the snapping of their beaks as they caught the flies. We ought to get Jack to tame a few swallows and take them with us to catch the flies, said Lucy Ann, slapping at a big one on her leg. Horrid things! I've been bitten by something already. You wouldn't think there would be any as high up as this, would you? Sally the slow worm came out to eat the fly that Lucy Ann had killed. She was getting much too tame for Dinah's liking. She lay in the sun, gleaming like silver, and then slid under Philip as Snowy came up inquiringly. Keep your nose out of things! Said Philip, pushing the kid away as it tried to nose under him to find the slow worm. Snowy butted him hard and then tried to get on his lap. Too hot, too hot, said Philip. Why did we ever bring a little pest like you, Snowy? You breathed down my neck all night. Lucy Ann giggled. She loved Snowy. They all did. The kid was mischievous, given to butting, and didn't mind treading on anyone. But he was so lively, so full of spring and bounce. So affectionate that it was impossible to be cross with him for long. Come on, said Philip at last. David's clearing his throat as if he's going to tell us we're too lazy for words. David had a habit of clearing his throat about a dozen times before he spoke. It was a nervous habit which Kiki copied to perfection. She would sit near him and make a noise as if she was clearing her throat every time he did the same thing. Then she would go off into a cackle of laughter. David always stared at her solemnly when she did this. They travelled well that second day and went a long way. When the time came to camp again, David looked earnestly over the mountains as if he was searching for something. Lost your handkerchief, old chap, said Jack, and everyone laughed. David looked solemnly at him, not understanding. Then he suddenly began to flap his arms like wings and to say a few words in Welsh. He looked comical standing there, flapping like that. The children had to turn away, trying not to laugh. He says tomorrow we shall see the butterfly valley, said Jack. Good! It ought to be a real sight, if it's anything like I imagine it to be. They had a meal and prepared to camp out again. The evening was not so fine as the day. It had clouded over, and there was no sunset to watch, and no stars to come gleaming out one by one. If it rains, you'll get wet, David, said Jack. David shrugged his shoulders and said something in his Welsh voice, then wrapped himself in his rug on the bare ground. It won't rain, said Philip, looking at the sky, but it's much colder. Ooh, I'll be glad of my sleeping bag tonight. Good night, called the girls. Sleep well. Good night. It'll be a lovely day again tomorrow. You just see, called back Philip, who thought himself a good weather forecaster. But he was wrong. When they awoke the next morning, they looked out on a completely different world. Chapter Nine, a different world. Lucianne awoke first. She was cold. She snuggled down into her sleeping bag and then opened her eyes. 
She stared out of the open tent flap, expecting to see the green mountainside and the distant mountains towering up into the sky. But they weren't there. Instead, a white mist swirled past the tent flap, some of it putting thin, cold fingers into the tent itself. There was nothing to see at all except this mist. The mountains had gone. The trees by the camp were blotted out. Even the donkeys couldn't be seen. What's happened? said Lucianne, astonished. Golly, it's a thick mist come up. She awoke Dinah, and the girls peered out in dismay at the misty mountainside. Now and again, a tiny bit of view could be seen as the mist thinned a little, but it grew thick again at once. It's a cloud, said Dinah. You know how we see clouds resting on mountain tops? Well, this is one. It's resting on us. It's like a thick fog we can't see through. Blow! The boys woke up then, and the girls could hear their dismayed voices. They called to them Jack! Philip! Isn't this sickening? We can't see a thing. It may clear when we've had breakfast, said Philip cheerfully, appearing out of the mist with Snowy at his heels. Gosh, it's chilly. I'm going to put on a warm jersey. David also appeared, looking very doleful. He swung his arm out towards the valley and poured out a torrent of Welsh. He's quite excited about it, isn't he? said Jack. I wish I could follow him when he talks like that. I just don't understand a word. They decided to have breakfast in one of the tents because the mist made everything damp and chilly. David preferred to stay outside. Dinah didn't want to come into the tent because of Sally, and only agreed to if she was allowed to sit in the doorway, ready to escape if the slow worm appeared. It was not so cheerful a meal as usual. The children missed the magnificent view they had been used to, and were afraid perhaps David wouldn't take them on their way that day. But the mist cleared a little in an hour's time, and David seemed quite willing to go. They loaded up the donkeys, mounted, and set off down the track. They could see some way ahead of them now, for the sun was rising higher and trying to dissolve the mist with its heat. It'll be all right, said Jack. I almost caught sight of the sun then. But then the mist came down again, and it was only just possible to see the donkey in front. I feel as if I ought to hold your donkey's tail in case you disappear in the mist, shouted Jack to Dinah. You know, like elephants do in circuses when they come into the ring, all holding on to one another's tails. The mist thickened even more, and the little company stopped to discuss what to do. It was difficult to get anything intelligible out of David, who seemed suddenly to have forgotten any English words he knew. Jack flapped his arms, raised his eyebrows, and pointed in front of him, meaning to ask if they were near the butterfly valley. David understood, but he hesitated. I hope he hasn't lost the way, said Jack to Philip. He seemed sure enough of the direction yesterday. Now he doesn't seem very certain. Blow. Well, we can't stop here, said Dinah, shivering in the clammy mist. There's no shelter and it's jolly cold. Oh, for the sun again. Ride on, said Jack to David. It's the only thing to do till we find some kind of shelter. It's too cold to hang about till the mist has gone. If we go the wrong way, we can turn back and go right when the mist goes. So they went on, following David's donkey through the wet mist. Kiki was very silent. She didn't understand the mist and was afraid of it. Snowy kept close to Philip's donkey and was not nearly so full of spring and liveliness. Everyone disliked the mist thoroughly. When we find a sheltered place, we'll stop for lunch, said Philip. I'm sure we're all getting frightfully hungry now, but we seem to be on quite a bare bit of mountainside, hopeless to picnic in. We'd all be down with colds tomorrow. They ambled on, nose to tail, pulling their jerseys close, glad of their coats too. Jack began to look rather worried. He stopped his donkey and went to walk beside Philip's. What's up? said Philip, seeing Jack's serious face. We've left the track, said Jack. Haven't you noticed? We've followed some kind of track up till an hour or two back, but now I'm pretty certain we've lost it. Goodness knows where David's heading for. I doubt if he's even noticed we're not on any track at all. 
Philip whistled. Don't let the girls hear you. They'll be scared. Yes, you're right. There's not the vestige of a track here. David's lost the way. Better ask him, said Jack, and rode to the front of the line. Is this the right way? he asked David slowly, so as to be understood. Where is the track? He pointed downwards to the ground. David was looking solemn too. He shrugged his shoulders and said something in his sing song voice. Jack rode back to Philip. I think he knows he's off the track, but he's hoping to pick it up further on. Anyway, he doesn't seem inclined to stop or go back. Well, he's our guide, said Philip after a pause. We'll have to trust him. He knows these mountains better than we do. Yes, but he's so shy, said Jack. He wouldn't be able to tell us we were lost. I wouldn't put it past him to go on losing us deeper and deeper in these mountains once he'd begun. He just wouldn't know what else to do. What a horrible idea, said Philip. Good thing we've got so much food with us, if that's what he means to do. They came at last to a big outcrop of rocks, which would give them shelter from the wet, chilly wind. Better have a meal here, said Philip. I'd like something hot to drink. Did Mrs. Evans put in a kettle? Yes. If we can find a stream or spring, we'll build a little fire and boil some water for cocoa or something, said Jack. But there was no spring and no stream. It was most annoying. Considering the dozens we've passed this morning and waded through, I call it a bit hard that there's not even a tiny one here, said Dinah. I'm jolly thirsty, too. They had to have a meal without anything to drink. They were very hungry, and the food seemed to warm them a little. They played a game of catch to get themselves thoroughly warm after the meal. David looked as if he thought they had gone mad. Snowy joined in wildly, neatly tripping everyone up. Kiki rose in the air and screamed. Look at David's face! He thinks we're all crazy! giggled Lucy Ann. She sank down on a rock. Oh, <laughs> I can't run any more. I've got a stitch in my side. Stitch in my side! Stitch in my side! chanted Kiki, running all the words together. Pop goes the weasel! The mist's clearing! Hurrah! suddenly cried Jack, and he pointed upwards. The sun could quite clearly be seen. Struggling to get through the clouds of mist. Everyone cheered up at once. Even David looked less dismal. Let's try to get to the Butterfly Valley before the evening, said Jack to David, doing the flapping business vigorously to make sure David understood. David nodded. They mounted the donkeys again and set off once more. They could see much further in front of them now. Quite a big stretch of mountainside was spread before them. The world suddenly seemed a much bigger place. They rode on steadily. The mist thinned more and more rapidly, and the children felt the heat of the sun on their heads. They took off their coats, reveling in the warmth after the chilliness of the mist. Look, we can see the nearest mountain tops now, called Jack, and the distant ones will soon be uncovered too. Thank goodness. We ought to see the Vale of Butterflies soon, said Lucy Ann eagerly. David said we'd get there today. I wonder where it is. Look, there's a butterfly, Philip. Philip glanced at it. Only a meadow brown, he said. We've seen heaps of those. He looked before him searchingly and then put his field glasses to his eyes. There's a valley which might be it, he said, pointing. Hey, David, is that the Vale of Butterflies? David looked where Philip was pointing. He shrugged his shoulders. Yes, no, he said. Yes, no? Whatever does he mean by that? said Philip in disgust. I suppose in plain English he means he hasn't the faintest idea. Well, we'll go on and hope for the best. It looks a nice sheltered kind of valley, the sort that might be hot enough for all kinds of insects and flowers. Picturing a perfect paradise of brilliant flowers and equally brilliant butterflies, The children rode on and on towards the valley in the far distance. It was much further than they thought. That was the worst of travelling in mountains. Everywhere was about twice as far as you imagined it to be. Most disappointing. It was late when they rode into the valley, which was really more of a shallow depression between two high mountains than a real lowland valley. 
Certainly it was sheltered, and certainly it had more flowers in it than they had so far seen. But there were no butterflies. This can't be it," said Philip in disappointment. "Is it, David?" David shook his head. He was looking round in a puzzled manner, and it was quite clear that he really didn't know where he was. If this is not the butterfly place, where is it? Asked Jack slowly and clearly. David shook his head again. It was really maddening not being able to speak Welsh. Well," said Philip, "he's brought us the wrong way to a place he doesn't know, but it's quite warm and sheltered, so we'll make the best of it tonight. Tomorrow we'll get the map from David, see if we can find out the way, and set off with ourselves as guides. He's as much use as Kiki to guide us in these mountains. They set up their camp again, feeling rather disappointed. They had so hoped to come to the place they wanted that night and set up camp properly for a few days to revel in hordes of common and uncommon butterflies. Now they would have to ride on still further, and goodness knew if they would ever find it. They crawled into their sleeping bags and called good night, just as the stars gleamed out. David was sleeping as usual outside, but in the night the boys woke up suddenly. David was crawling into their tent. He was trembling with fright. Noises, he said in English, then poured out something in Welsh. He was very frightened. Sleep pure, he said, and crept between the boys. They were amused and puzzled. What ever could have scared David so much? Chapter Ten, A Disturbing Night. The sun was shining brightly when the camp awoke next day. David had better wake, Skinkly, and Bill came at once. Still, if we go far away from the stream, we'd better leave a note for Bill in case he comes and we're not there, like we did yesterday. They had taken the note off Dapple's harness the night before when they had. They forced herself to laugh. Well, fancy that! I really did think it was somebody touching me. It felt. Peeping through the curtains that hung before them, nodded and frowned. The same thought occurred to him as had occurred to Philip. 